Gait and balance difficulties present a tremendous challenge for elderly patients and their caregivers. These patients are especially likely to experience falls with subsequent injury, and this can lead to prolonged hospital stays and nursing home placement. There are many different regions of the central and peripheral nervous system that control gait and balance. In the brainstem, there are certain regions that communicate with spinal pattern generators. These spinal pattern generators are neural circuits that generate periodic motor control for locomotion. Through this communication between the brainstem and the spinal pattern generators, gait can be modified as necessary. There are also other areas of the nervous system involved in postural control and balance. These include the visual system, the vestibular system, the cerebellum, and the proprioceptive receptors. When examining a patient with a gait or balance disorder, there are important key features to assess during the gait evaluation. In addition, it is important to pay close attention to the other possible neurological signs in the remainder of the neurological examination. These may provide clues regarding the ultimate diagnosis. Some of these features will be highlighted in the videos that accompany this chapter. Parkinsonism is a common source of gait dysfunction in adults. However, since the Parkinsonian gait rarely happens in isolation, it is important to discuss the syndrome of Parkinsonism in general. Uh, the Parkinsonian syndrome is characterized by rest tremor, bradykinesia or slowness, uh, stiffness or rigidity, and postural instability. The most common source of Parkinsonism is idiopathic Parkinson's disease, or PD. Uh, it is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's disease. Uh, other causes of Parkinsonism include the atypical syndromes, which include multiple systems atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, or corticobasal syndrome. Secondary causes include vascular Parkinsonism or drug-induced Parkinsonism. The tremor of Parkinson's disease is most typically asymmetric in its presentation and most prominent at rest. It has a slower frequency of around 4 to 6 hertz and has a pill rolling or pronation supination character to it. This first gentleman has tremor predominant idiopathic Parkinson's disease. You can see he has a very asymmetric tremor with his right upper extremity, rest tremor, almost no tremor at all on the left. He also motioned towards his right shoulder to show that he probably has some stiffness there, again on the most symptomatic side, the right side. There you can see a very rolling, pill rolling form of the tremor. This gentleman is another man with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. He also has an asymmetric rest tremor with the typical pill rolling uh, pronation supination motion. It's most prominent at rest. There is a little bit on the left as well. Slightly attenuates with holding his hands out in a po for a postural tremor, although it's still probably graded at two or three on the UPDRS. And then on action tremor with finger to nose, it attenuates slightly more. And this last gentleman, he has a genetic form of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and he has a severe tremor, probably graded a four on, on UPDRS. The slowness or bradykinesia of Parkinson's disease can manifest in several ways for patients. Patients commonly describe a loss of manual dexterity, especially with fine motor tasks. They also report that activities of daily living, such as dress, dressing, hygiene, or eating take much more time. The handwriting becomes smaller, uh, called, this is called micrographia, and the speech becomes quieter and more monotone. This is called hypophonia. On general neurologic examination, the examiner can take note of several aspects of bradykinesia. Uh, there is a general loss of spontaneous movement, uh, including uh, hand gesturing while speaking, or the unconscious movements uh, that we shift in our seat to get comfortable, these are all diminished in Parkinson's disease. Um, there is, as mentioned, the micrographia, the hypophonia or quiet speech. Uh, there's also decreased facial expression or hypomemia, which can manifest as decreased blink rate, uh, just general loss of subtle uh, facial expression. Here we see four patients with idiopathic Parkinson's disease that will show a graded uh, scaling on the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, or the UPDRS. 
This first lady is normal on the right, a zero. Uh, on the left hand, she might have a score of one, given the slight decrement in amplitude and speed of the motions. The second gentleman, we would probably score a two, as he has a few hesitations in those rapid repetitive movements, especially on the right upper extremity. This third person is a lady with much more significant bradykinesia. You can see she has frequent hesitations in performing these repetitive movements with very decreased amplitude and decreased speed. And this fourth gentleman uh, is barely able to perform the task at all, so this would probably be graded a four on the UPDRS. Rigidity is experienced by the patient as stiffness. When it's more significant, it can take on an aching or even painful quality to it. Rigidity is difficult to appreciate visually, so it is picked up by the examiner as increased tone or increased resistance of skeletal muscle across a joint. Uh, as opposed to spasticity, uh, this increased tone or resistance is even across the, the full range of motion of the joint and it's velocity independent. So it takes, it's been described as a lead pipe rigidity. As mentioned, rigidity is usually very difficult to visualize, but as you can see in this patient, the rigidity is so significant that the examiner visually has difficulty uh, passively moving the joints at the elbow, wrists, and knees. As with most aspects of Parkinson's disease, Gait dysfunction varies widely from patient to patient. This is not only due to early Parkinson's disease versus advanced Parkinson's disease, but due to the vast clinical heterogeneity seen from patient to patient. Uh, some patients have a very tremor predominant form of the disease, which tends to be tends to have less gait dysfunction, whereas the akinetic rigid uh, form of the disease tends to have earlier and more prominent gait dysfunction. In early or mild idiopathic Parkinson's disease, gait dysfunction or postural instability is not typically a major source of disability in the patient. However, there can be subtle symptoms that the patient picks up uh, or signs that the, that the examiner can pick up on examination. One of the earliest signs of Parkinsonian gait on exam is the decreased arm swing. Um, as with the other features of Parkinson's disease or idiopathic Parkinson's disease, it typically presents asymmetrically. So where one arm might swing quite normally, the other one might have a subtle decrease in the amplitude of the arm swing or if more significant, maybe tend to ha be held in a flexed posture, flexed at the elbow. Um, another early sign of uh, Park in the Parkinsonian gait is the classic stooped posture where the neck and trunk tend to be flexed forward. Patients also describe a problem with their steps, sometimes even early in the disease process. Uh, they can describe this as catching their foot on when stepping up on a curve or a step, or maybe a subtle dragging of one foot over the other. Um, this can be picked up on an exam with decreased stride length, step to step, uh, versus normal individuals but can also, when more significant or even severe, manifest as the classic Parkinsonian shuffling gait with each foot dragging on the floor, not having the good stride length or picking it up, clearing the floor well. This first patient has an almost normal gait. You can see the rest tremor in the right arm. However, his stride length is normal, as is his arm swing. He only has a minimally stooped posture. The second patient has more significantly stooped posture and a decreased arm swing on the right. However, his arm swing on the left and his stride length are quite normal. This third patient has decreased arm, arm swing bilaterally. Uh, she has much more decreased stride length uh, and you can see here the turning on block. This last patient has more significantly decreased arm swing and stride length, but again is walking with little difficulty. With progression of Parkinson's disease into its moderate or advanced stages, the classic postural instability becomes more of a source of disability for patients. Postural instability can manifest in several ways for the patient as well. When combined with the dysfunction of stepping or the shuffling gait, it can lead to a festination. 
uh, festination is a hastening forward of uh, a Parkinson's patient's steps. Um, it can be thought of as, as the steps are decreased and you start to lose your balance. The, the top part of the body uh, continues to propel forward where the feet can get hung up and in an effort to keep one's balance, the feet start uh, hastening forward. Uh, at, for some patients, this can be so severe that the only thing that will stop them is, is grabbing a hold of the door or something else. When postural instability becomes more severe, um, the, uh, a patient's entire postural reflexes can be lost such that any perturbance can make them have a, a, a fall. On examination, this is tested by the pull test. An abnormal pull test is when the patient takes more than two or three steps of retropulsion before recovering their balance. This would be a mild form of retropulsion. When retropulsion is more significant, they will take many more steps. And if there's complete lack of postural reflexes, no reflex steps may happen at all and the examiner may have to catch the patient. These three patients show more significantly affected gait. They all have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. This first patient is probably the most affected. His stride length and arm swing are very decreased. There you can see this turning on block. He also had some slight freezing in that turn. Uh, the amount that his stride length is shortened uh, and the festination interfere with his gait, making it difficult. Therefore, I would rate that a, a, a two on the Peter S. This second patient has decreased stride length and some dystonia in the neck, which make his gait somewhat difficult. This third patient shows the response to medications that can happen in Parkinsonian gait. First here we see him with significantly stooped posture. And then next with meds, he has better stride length and although his posture is still affected, has, is improved somewhat. These three patients show severely affected Parkinsonian gait. This first patient actually has a diagnosis of multiple systems atrophy, or MSA. You can see the difficulty she has rising out of a chair, even needing assistance using her hands to push up. When walking, she is unable to walk without an assist device here, her cane, and has much difficulty taking any steps. Once she's out in the open, she fares a little better. However, her shortened stride length and severe truncal dystonia here leaning towards the right, which could be described as Pisa syndrome, which is frequently seen in MSA, are causing her severe gait disturbance. This second patient has idiopathic Parkinson's disease and is off his medications. We can see that he needs full assistance to stand and is unable to even take one or two steps in his gait. This last patient demonstrates the postural instability seen in some Parkinson's patients. On pull test for balance, she has complete lack of postural responses and needs to be caught by the examiner. Another particularly disabling aspect of the Parkinsonian gait, especially in advanced stages, is freezing of gait. Freezing of gait is defined as the inability to take effective steps. It is a major source of disability for Parkinson's patients, not only greatly decreasing their mobility, but also getting them into danger as this can provoke uh, falls. Patients describe the feeling of their feet being stuck to the floor. Uh, another particularly challenging part of freezing of gait is that it is unpredictable and dynamic. Uh, it's actually notorious that a patient who is greatly disabled by freezing at home will come into the examiner's office and have more normal or only mildly Parkinsonian gait without any freezing episodes. There are several things that can provoke freezing of gait though. Uh, perhaps the most common is start hesitation or difficulty initiating their gait. So when the, the, pa when the patient stands up to first starting, their feet are immediately stuck to the floor. Perhaps the next most common uh, for a uh, trigger of freezing of gait is making turns. Uh, in a more milder gait dysfunction, this can be described as turning on block, where the patient has to take several more steps to make that turn instead of just pivoting on one foot and changing direction. But with true freezing of gait, when attempting to make a turn, a patient will freeze in place. Um, in fact, any form of stimuli, whether it be auditory or visual, can provoke freezing episodes. 
it is thought that this is because any stimulus can draw attention away from the person's gait and then provoke a freezing episode. Here we see a patient off his medications who has significant difficulty walking through the tight space of a doorway. In fact, the examiner here is probably adding an extra stimulus that makes it more difficult for him to walk. He also demonstrates some destination freezing. On his medications, he has no difficulty at all walking through the doorway. This second patient has an atypical Parkinsonism, possibly progressive supranuclear palsy. Here you can see the difficulty in him initiating his gait. This is called start hesitation or gait ignition failure. In the open hallway, he has little, if any, freezing. However, in his turn, you can see the freezing of a gait. Freezing of gait is notoriously difficult to sometimes capture in the open hallways of the doctor's office. Therefore, constructing a maze such as this can sometimes provoke freezing given that it causes more tight and narrow spaces and makes the patient go through many turns. Here, the tight spaces and frequent turns provoke almost continuous freezing of gait. Ataxia is a term used to describe the inability to perform coordinated movements as well as difficulty maintaining certain positions. Ataxia can affect almost any region of the body. Ocular motor control, limbs, hands, feet, gait, truncal stability. The underlying ideology of ataxia is basically a result of a disruption in communication amongst areas of the nervous system that are responsible for the coordination of movement. Individuals with cerebellar ataxia can display a variety of neurologic signs. Some of these include abnormal eye movements, dysarthria, intention tremor, dysmetria, dysdiatokinesis, a characteristic abnormal gait, and postural instability. In discussing each of these, abnormal eye movements can include nystagmus as well as uh, undershoot or overshoot. For example, when testing a patient for ataxia or problems with eye movements, one might ask them to look at an object and to vary between the examiner and the object. When looking at either the examiner or the object, instead of their eyes going directly to the target, they might overshoot the target and then come back and that might be due to an ataxia or cerebellar dysfunction. Regarding intention tremor, this is a tremor that usually occurs during voluntary movement. For example, if someone is trying to reach and touch the tip of the pen, somebody with an intention tremor, as they get closer to the target, they might have a little bit more difficulty. Dysmetria is usually the undershoot or overshoot of an intended position. It could be dysmetria of the eyes, as I've already described, or it could be in testing finger to nose or heel to shin. On finger testing, one might ask the patient to touch a target, and somebody with a dysmetria might overshoot or undershoot the target. And this could occur with the leg or the arm, and is often due to cerebellar dysfunction. Dystidokinesia is the impairment of alternating movements such as pronation supination or the movement of the hands um, in rapid alternating movements. Somebody with dysdiatokinesis due to a cerebellar problem will often have irregularity in the movement. Somebody with Parkinsonism just might be very slow but would be regular and it's usually the irregularity that is more of a cerebellar problem. A characteristic gait from a cerebellar disorder would often be wide-based. There might be unequal steps. There might be lateral deviations or deviation from one side to the other, basically an inability to maintain a straight line. And also an abnormal pattern of stopping and starting. Lastly was postural instability. There's often considerable difficulty w with a patient performing tandem walking, such as heel-to-toe walking. 
and truncal sway may be evident when a patient is trying to maintain a standing balance or sometimes even sitting. The causes of cerebellar ataxia include a broad range of neurologic disorders. When assessing a patient with a cerebellar ataxia, the examiner should consider several different possibilities for the underlying ideology. Some of these might include stroke, trauma, tumor, an exogenous substance such as alcohol, anti-epileptic medications or other drugs, uh, recreational drug use, as well as neurodegenerative diseases that would differ between children and adults. One might consider diseases such as multiple system atrophy, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease or CJD, um, Huntington's disease. In children, one might consider various disorders of development, uh, ataxia, telangiectasia, neuroacanthocytosis. There are many neurodegenerative disorders that can result in cerebellar ataxia. This video shows a left-handed patient with a midline and an asymmetric limb ataxic syndrome due to antineuronal autoimmune antibodies, specifically anti-GAD65 antibodies. On finger-to-nose testing, note that she has some very mild left arm ataxia. Note at the end of the finger-to-nose movement, when attempting to touch the examiner's finger, she has difficulty precisely touching the target, often undershooting or overshooting. This is a very subtle sign of ataxia in this patient and is called dysmetria. Note that it is important to test dysmetria by having the patient try to fully extend the arm. If the examiner does not do this, they may miss more subtle forms of dysmetria. On the patient's right side, she shows much more profound ataxia that is present throughout most of her movements, which worsen as she gets closer to the examiner's finger. This suggests that she has worse right rather than left cerebellar hemisphere dysfunction. Similarly, on heel to shin testing, she does much better. In fact, she is relatively normal on the left side, but she has severe ataxia or dysmetria on her right being barely able to perform the task. On gait testing, we see that she's very wide-based with difficulty turning and maintaining an upright balance either while standing or walking. She cannot even maintain an upright posture when attempting to stand with her feet together, even with her eyes open. Her midline and gait dysfunction suggests that she has a problem with the vermis of the cerebellum, which is a midline structure in the cerebellum. Her problems with limb dysmetria suggest that there is a problem with the cerebellar hemispheres or the lateral aspects of the cerebellum. Psychogenic gait disorders, uh, like psychogenic movement disorders in general, can be difficult from many perspectives, from assessment to diagnosis to treatment. Uh, one of the things that makes a diagnosis of psychogenic gait disorder difficult is that frequently a psychologic or psychiatric diagnosis is not found if you were to refer them to a psychiatrist. Also, even though the, the gait dysfunction is termed psychogenic, there is not always a source of stress, either conscious or subconscious, that can be found um, that provokes these gait problems. However, there are some principles that can be uh, relied upon to raise a red flag that the gait dysfunction might be uh, a psychogenic uh, etiology. One of these, and perhaps most importantly, is if the gait pattern does not fit into a specific known movement disorder. It does not look especially Parkinsonian, or if it does, there's some things that don't make uh, clinical or physiologic sense. It's not a classic ataxic gait, uh, or so forth. Another aspect is if there is inconsistency in how the gait dysfunction presents. Um, if there is wide variation uh, in terms of its severity, it fluctuates from very severe to mild, uh, even, or if it's, especially if it's episodic in nature, where sometimes they walk completely normally, and others the, the full-blown gait dysfunction comes out. This is not usually seen in, in movement disorders, at least. Um, 
Another issue is if there's complete remissions in the gait dysfunction for, for days or weeks at a time. This is, kinda, this is also um, unusual in psychogenic movement disorders. This patient demonstrates several features of the psychogenic gait. The first thing to note is that the phenomenology of the gait itself does not fit any particular pattern of a known neurologic diagnosis. Second, the bizarre movement seen here in this odd rhythmic bouncing and the flailing of the legs in his steps. Finally, altogether these movements are actually somewhat acrobatic and requ require more balance than a normal gait.